Welcome to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed theology. This is episode number 696 by my count. My name is Camden Busey. I'm in Grays Lake, Illinois, and I'm delighted to be back today for a really fun conversation, one I've been looking to, uh, looking forward to here for several weeks. Uh, but let me introduce to you our panel. We have with us in studio. I have a panelist in studio. Delighted to have with us uh, Ryan Noah, who serves as a, as kind of a doer of all things here at Reformed Forum. He's a executive assistant, uh, but also somewhat the director of Reformed Academy. Welcome back to the program, Ryan. It's good to have you. Thanks so much, Camden. It's great to be in studio in Grays Lake here. Yeah, I mean it's 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 a joy to have you here and to, to connect. And uh, we have two of us here in studio at Grays Lake, but we're also joined uh, by our, our esteemed guest. Uh, this is the first time on the program, Dr. Crawford Gribben, who is professor of the School of History, Anthropology, Philosophy, and Politics at Queen's University in Belfast, over in Northern Ireland. Welcome to the program, Dr. Gribben. It's great to see you today. Thanks, Camden. Thanks for the invitation to be here. We are honored to have you with us and uh, very much looking forward to this. We're going to be speaking about Dr. Grib, uh, Gribben's new book, Survival and Resistance in Evangelical America, Christian Reconstruction in the Pacific Northwest. It's by, published by Oxford University Press. I just finished it a few days ago. Thoroughly enjoyed it, uh, really, for good portions of it. Couldn't put it down. And uh, I've also listened to a few other interviews uh, that Crawford's done and uh try to link to some of those in the episode description as well. But coming at it from a different perspective, we're looking forward to this conversation and, and opening up uh, this this important subject, but one I think that at least people within our tradition, the OPC, or even broadly speaking, NAPARC in North America, or just the confessional conservative confessional community throughout the world, uh, there's an awareness of what's going on with Christian Reconstruction and the history with, with uh, folks like R.J. Rush, Dooney, and Gary North, and um, others such as uh, 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 Doug Wilson, but perhaps not a full understanding of what they're actually saying or teaching and, and how things have come to, to be the way they are and why they seem to be in many ways um, uh, collating or uh, gathering together in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. So we'll get into all of that today. But before we do so, I've got just a few things to mention. Of course, I always encourage people to visit us online at reformedforum.org. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, different offerings there. And uh, since Ryan's here, we'll also promote a Reformed Academy, which is our online educational component. We have a whole host of, uh, of free courses available. You can take them on demand at your own time. All you need to do is sign up for a free account. Just give us an email address so that you can actually log in and uh, it will track your progress. But we have courses on covenant theology, Westminster Shorter Catechism, uh, several courses on the apologetics of Van Til, which is certainly going to come into, into a discussion here today as we speak about uh, Christian Reconstruction and the interplay there with figures like Rush Dooney and Bonson. Uh, and uh, it, we've got a cohort going on. That, that'll be closed by the time uh, this airs, this episode airs, but keep your eyes open for uh, future offerings, all at reformedforum.org slash academy. And if you've got any questions, you can send us an email, and Ryan will pick up. Ryan over here. Yeah, I'd be happy to, happy to talk to you about Reformed Academy. Just mail at reformedforum.org. You got it. Looking forward to it. So uh, there's a lot of great opportunities, a lot of good things going on here at Reformed Forum, and we're happy uh, we're happy to serve. So if you've got any questions, uh, email us and let us know. Well, let's open up the book here, Survival and Resistance in Evangelical America. Uh, Crawford, uh, certainly this this fascinates me, uh, and uh, I'm glad this book is written. No doubt uh, Ryan is, knows this uh, tradition quite a bit more than I do in this history and is well-read in the primary literature a lot more than I am has a lot more to say. But at least at first look, it seems, to be honest, it seems like an odd project for an historian from Northern Ireland to undertake. So how were you introduced to this history, and how does it relate to your particular research interests? Thanks, Camden. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a fair question. What on earth takes someone from Belfast to North Ireland? So, <laughs> um, you know, don't, don't we have enough religious nutcases at home? Well, of course we do. Um, <clears throat> but at least when you go elsewhere, you get to meet nicer ones. Uh, than some of the ones that that you know um, that I might be involved with here. Um, I began working on this project, I suppose, about 25 years ago when I was doing my PhD in Glasgow at University of Strathclyde. And uh, I used to go frequently across to a bookshop in Edinburgh, James Dixon Books, which still operates today, great secondhand bookshop for wow. um, 
items of Scottish reform provenance. Anyway, um, I, I literally stumbled over a pile of these Credenda Agenda magazines that were down in their basement. And, um, you know, it, this was about maybe 1995, the autumn of 1995. Credenda Agenda had been gone for about seven or maybe seven or eight years by that point. And, um, it, you know, I, I took them home. I, I, you know, I, I began to read them. It was it was quite, you know, an extraordinary experience in many ways. I was spending my days reading Puritan apocalyptic material yeah. and my night reading Credenda Agenda. There was this kind of lovely crossover uh -huh. uh, between the two. You know, there's a real kind of continuity between the way in which a lot of my 17th century subjects were thinking about um, res current current responsibilities and future prospects. And, I, you know, I saw the same kinds of themes coming out in Credenda Agenda. And through Credenda Agenda um, and through other sources in the bookshop, I became uh, interested in reading the work by Gary DeMar initially, uh, then Gary North, um, eventually uh, to Rush Dooney, once I realised that Rush Dooney was not some kind of drug, but actually uh, a, a writer <laughs> with some interesting things to say. Uh, and um, over the course of time, you know, just, just kept thinking about some of the things that were going on uh, coming out of North Idaho, watch the community that Doug Wilson was leading grow, evolve, change its name, become increasingly self-consciously reformed, not least in the, the stylization of the, the church's name, moving from Community Evangelical Fellowship to Christkirk sometime around, I think, 1998 or 1999, and, you know, kept in touch with um, some of the things that were being published, especially in issues like infant baptism, um, as I was sort of reading my way through some of these controversies uh, that, 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 that interest us. Um, and I suppose, you know, all, all of that was going on and, and, that, and that was interesting. Uh, but then about 2008, the financial crash came and I became interested in some of the online discussions about survivalist cultures. And especially um, a website run by a man called James Wesley Rawls, mm -hmm. who identified himself then, I think still does, as a Reformed Baptist. And James Wesley Rawls defined this concept of the American redoubt. So um, this, um, this is a, a section of um, Idaho, Montana, eastern Washington, eastern Oregon, and so on, that kind of area, which he thought... Um, was really ideally placed to be a, a holdout for traditional Christian values as the as the the rest of American culture began to crumble. Um, so, what was really interesting about James Wesley Rawls was that he began to publish um, he began to publish novels. And now his, his, his novels were initially self-published. Then he began to get really big deals for some of his novels with, you know, really major publishers began to take these on. And what really caught my attention was when in one of these novels, some of the characters actually ended up going to, to Doug Wilson's church. Right. Uh, and I think if I remember correctly, um, one of them was serving as a security detail outside Christ, uh, Christ Church, Moscow, Idaho, which is just a, a fascinating moment of crossover. So I was working in Dublin at that point, which is not in Northern Ireland, Camden. Uh, it's, it's in a separate country, uh, just for clarification. Uh, so I was working in Dublin at that point with a good friend of mine still, who's from Coeur d'Alene, Scott Spurlock, who teaches theology at Glasgow University. And Scott and I decided that we would love to do a bit of a road trip. But, you know, academics, they don't want to pay for anything themselves. Of course not. So we had to, we had to turn this into a research project to sure. get funding uh, to pay our way to drive around eastern Washington and north Idaho, which we did. And it was great fun enormous fun and you know we, we had a great time but we also met some really interesting people saw some really um, um interesting sometimes peculiar sometimes even um slightly dangerous things um talking to a really quite a wide range of people who are associated with this movement into the pacific northwest so the really important thing i think to realize about this is it's a very decentralized movement that there's no one leader there's no one place that people gather to you know that there's a lot of different agendas here a lot of different um, aspirations a lot of different kinds of ambitions and um, some people are much more confident about being able to survive the impending crisis than others all of them want to and um, all of them have slightly different views for what might come in the aftermath of this crisis so anyway um, there we were driving around and you know we, we spent a, a really interesting weekend in Moscow Idaho in the summer of 2015 um, with folk from Christkirk 
um, from New St Andrews College and so on. And we, we had a really interesting chat. The first night we arrived, we went to the bar, which is the only student-friendly bar in Moscow, Idaho, and it's run by someone who goes to Doug Wilson's church. <laughs> and, you know, we, 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 we had, you know, I, of course I was sipping orange juice. Everyone else was into their kind of heavy duty stuff um, or perhaps not. But, um, you know, we were sitting there having, having this conversation and, I, you know, we, we raised the issue of James Wesley Rawls. And were, were, they, were they aware of James Wesley Rawls? And none of the faculty members that we were hanging out with, I think, had heard of him. I think Doug Wilson had heard of him. But none of them were aware of the status of their congregation in this incredibly powerful, incredibly diversified survivalist culture. So that was a really telling moment of disjunction between what I might have thought was the case before I actually got there to... Um, to, to see to see what was going on with Scott, my friend Scott Spurlock. Wow. So I mean, that, that that was really how it how it started. Camden, summer twenty fifteen, driving around, back again in the summer twenty sixteen, um, some long distance telephone call and interviews, stretching back I suppose to twenty thirteen, and then you know in in, in the period after that, um, and you know the book that we're talking about is mm-hmm. is the fruit of that, um, 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 very well uh, receipted. Um, search <laughs> trip. <laughs> well, we're thankful that that uh, occurred, and uh, we're reaping the the fruits of that labor, the benefits of it, and uh, to much great interest and and uh, I think personal edification for me. It's caused me to think about a lot of things uh, in terms of the interrelationship of um, the church and state, uh, just the nature of the the United States. There's so many things that have been happening globally, but especially in the United States. You know, thinking of the the previous. Uh, president and the current election, the previous election. There's there's so many intersection points here to think of how uh, Reconstruction uh, fits into that is is phenomenal. You know, one thing you you, you you sparked my interest here in terms of we have fiction crossing over into the real world and and uh, how some people may not even be aware that they're part of the, <laughs> these fictional narratives that are that are you know we're talking millions of copies sold of these books with Harper Collins and other publishers. This is no joke. This is this is a big deal. Uh, it reminds me of uh, this podcast I listened to a uh, long time ago. It might have been Radio Lab talking about uh, this this uh, phenomena called kayfabe and its use within professional wrestling, and uh, it finds kind of a historical antecedent with Don Quixote because you you end up with you know Miguel de Cervantes writing this this uh, book, and then other people started to steal the Don Quixote character and writing their own fan fiction with it. And he uh, didn't like it and started to write in his own official novels reactions to the detractors in the real world. And it's just at some point you start to lose sight of what's real and what isn't. So we got Doug Wilson, the character in the John Wesley Rawls novels and the church and other figures. And you start to I can imagine there are some people who think these are historical figures. Uh, that moved and joined Christ Church while others, you know, recognized John Wesley Wall, Rawls uh, made them up. But I'm curious here, you're joking a bit. Uh, we were both joking a bit before in terms of um, uh, Americans' awareness of uh, anything outside of our own country uh, <laughs> regarding, oh, you know, Ireland and Northern Ireland and Belfast and Dublin and all that. But people might not even, even Americans might not understand some of the key features here of the Pacific Northwest. And you mentioned Eastern Washington, Northern Idaho, Eastern Oregon, Montana as well. Um, I'm curious here, uh, obviously there's some, there's thought to be some strategic advantages uh, to holding up there, uh, given the impending apocalypse, whenever that might happen. But zooming out and bigger picture. I'm curious with this whole project as you've studied it, you've done a tremendous amount of work, scholarly work on Puritan uh, apocalyptic thought, millenarianism at the Westminster Assembly, all that sort of thing. But just your general take, and we'll get into the details, but is this a distinctly American phenomenon? And, And could such a thing as what has been happening in the Pacific Northwest among Christian Reconstructionists, could that sort of thing happen in Northern Ireland or even more generally the United Kingdom? Yeah, that, that that's a really interesting question, Camden, and it's one that that we struggled with a lot, Scott and I, as we talked about what we were witnessing as we travelled around, and as we continue to think about um, as as I was writing this book, uh, it's a difficult question to answer. I think I think there is something very distinctly American about it. 
So, you know, th th there's a lot of narratives in American culture glorifying the West and, you know, frontier life and the simplicity and the, the, the authentic American values of life on the edges of civilization. You know, there's a long, uh, a long history of, 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 uh, of, the, in, in, of, of using those kinds of tropes. So I think there is something distinctly American about it. I'm not sure whether we could say there's something uniquely American about it. I think that's a different kind of claim. I think certainly, I think certainly that it would be very difficult for for the for the success of the Moscow Idol community to be replicated anywhere else. One of the really striking things about fieldwork, and this is back now in 2015, 2016. Um, talking to New St Andrews graduates or talking to people who are part of the church's community. One of the really striking features of those conversations was their sense that so much of the achievements of that community hung around a tiny handful of individuals. And, you know, there, there, I don't talk about this in the book, but in some of those conversations, there was almost a sense of anxiety. So, you know, the, the, this community has really quite an extraordinary ambition, you know, and to be fair to this community, it has really made quite extraordinary moves towards realising large parts of this ambition. Absolutely. Uh, it wants to make Moscow, Idaho a Christian town. But from that, it really wants to, you know, to see the, the, the social religious reconstruction of North America, you know, and to play a part in, you know, what Bavink might call a great sweep of victory of Christ's kingdom around the earth. So, so they, they, they have really clear ambitions about what, what they want to achieve. The, um, I, I, I suppose, though, the, the, the question that haunts a lot of that is the question of whether this can be achieved anywhere else or whether there is something um, unique about the, if you like, the ecclesiological or sociological ecology mm -hmm. of Moscow, Idaho, that makes this much more plausible or much more efficiently realised in that location than it could be anywhere else. So, I mean, you think about what's going on in Moscow, there's uh, two very, very substantial church congregations, the, the combined membership of which totals around 10% of the town's population. They have a, 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 a K-12 school, Christian school. They've got a very successful, very high quality liberal arts college. They've got a, musical, a music conservatory, and they've got a number of very, very key businesses in the locality. So, you know, what that ecology means is that someone from, I don't know, France, England, uh, the Caribbean can decide to, to move either with their family or indeed as a student to go to study uh, at New St Andrews College. Very often, you know, as often happens, uh, but, but certainly uh, it seems to be the case fairly regularly with the people we spoke to, uh, you know, they, they, they meet a potential marriage partner, they decide to get married, they settle down. Why not? Moscow's a beautiful town. They're surrounded by like-minded people. That there are friendly workplaces where they can get employment, you know, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden it's a, a virtuous circle of success that, that can pull people in, that can attract them into something that's very credible, right. very strong, very clearly articulated, but actually give them the sociological, uh, even economic supports to keep all of this moving forward in a, in, in, in a, a way that's obviously beneficial to the individual, to their family, but but you know, but to the, the church community as well. Whether it's beneficial to the wider town environment or to the Moscow Pullman area um, is is obviously something that's contested um, a lot in the local media. And you know, for all that um, people within this community might see this as as a really striking example of post-millennial success, we might say, that there are many other people in the community who see this um, who see this ambition as something that should worry them. Um, and certainly some of the rhetoric that comes out in some of the community's publications um, is, is rhetoric that they find very deeply troubling. Mm. Yeah. Um, boy, you, you, you brought us in there to, uh, to give us a portrait of what you called the per, perhaps the most post-millennial town in America, um, and I, I wonder if you could uh, draw out a bit more for us how classical Christian education in Moscow is an area that you've identified where these Reconstructionists have actually begun to reconstruct, as opposed to just survive and and resist. But they've really um, positively uh, built something. Uh, with an ostensibly biblical worldview, how have how have they 
uh, flourished and, and borne fruit according to their own goals of, of reconstruction with regard to New St. Andrews College, Lagos Christian School, etc.? Great, great, Ryan. No, great question. I suppose I should just preface my answer with a, a qualification of um, some of the things I suppose I've been saying. Uh, I, I don't think Doug Wilson would see himself as a as a, a fully fledged reconstructionist. He's obviously very influenced by Rush Dooney. You know, he's, he's very vocal about that, and um, he doesn't hide it. You know, he he, he you know writes regularly about Rush Dooney, quotes Rush Dooney regularly in his writing, um, as well. Uh, in, in conversations uh, with Doug one day. Um, he, he, he was happier to describe himself as a Reconstructionist 0.5 than as a Reconstructionist 2.0, but, <laughs> but, still, but, but still, you know, within the category of Reconstruction, not a kind of a fully fledged Gary North uh, Mark II, uh, but, but, but as, as obviously as his own person with his, with a, I think compared to the, the first generation of Reconstructionists, a much broader set of social goals and cultural goals. So not just political or cultural, but actually not just political and social, but actually social and cultural as well. And obviously, as you said, Ryan, um, the, the, the very successful efforts to reconstruct education in Moscow, initially with the Logos School back in the late 80s, early 90s, and then with the establishment of the Liberal Arts College, New St Andrews College in the mid 1990s, early to mid 1990s, they have made, I think, very very powerful, very impressive strides towards realising some of these goals. Now, the Logos School, uh, interestingly, was established before uh, the Christ Church, or as it was then, Community Evangelical Fellowship, was actually a Reformed church. So, so this, this was not necessarily um, a, a, an education project driven by explicitly Reconstructionist agendas. In fact, it wasn't even initially driven by explicitly Reformed agendas. It was purely uh, an attempt by a number of local Christian families to provide a more credible worldview Christianity um, for their covenant children. Um, however, as the leadership team within the community moved increasingly towards embracing reformed ideas and reform values, it took on a much more um, robustly reformed view. A lot of this, you know, a, a lot of the, the, the movement towards classical education was driven by um, some of the folks' interest in an essay by Dorothy Sayers, The Lost right. Tools of Learning. Mm -hmm. um, recovering Lost Tools of Learning, you know, is, is a big trope uh, in a lot of Doug Wilson's writing in the mid-1990s up, to, I suppose, more or less the present day. Um, the, the, the essay... Uh, the, the, the essay, the, the, the Sayers essay uh, that I mentioned, had been republished in the National Review back, I think, in the early 80s. I'm not quite sure when, but, but that was where Doug Wilson sourced the essay, sourced this view of classical Christian education. Obviously, then they reprinted it on, um, whenever they established their own press, and we we'll talk about that later, and, and, and began to, to make this theoretical manifesto, I suppose you might say, a, a centrepiece for how they thought about Christian education. Now, Reconstructionists at, in the 1990s were also running a fully-fledged Reconstructionist college, Christ College down in somewhere in Virginia, I forget exactly where. And, you know, th that was being, you know, classes were being taught there by Kenneth Gentry and a number of other familiar names within the Reconstructionist world. But I, I, my, my sense is it was guided much more by the Rushduni model of education, which was very, very sceptical of classical values. Um, and you, you get echoes of this, I think, in some of the writing of Gary North as well. That there's a real fear that exposing um, Christian families' children to... Uh, you know, the, the kind of sexual politics, let's say, of, of Greek and Latin literature was actually exposing them to harm. Now, in Moscow, Idaho, um, as, as the project really began to take off in the 1990s, there was a much more robust view that, that you know, the, the, the Christian worldview could make sense of and indeed critique some of those values while still um, distilling um, the, the, the potency that they represented in terms of critical thinking and also just cultural literacy, I think, uh, as well. So all of that was going on in Moscow. Then as the Logos School really began to take off, it became one of the flagship uh, schools of, of um, at a national level of uh, the classical Christian um, 
agenda uh, for, for, for primary and secondary education. Uh, and from that school then, there was established a national association of classical Christian schools, which has grown and grown. You can look right. at the website, it's incredibly professionally laid mm -hmm. out. Um, the speaker, I think two years ago at their national convention was Ben Sass. So, you know, I, again, th th these are not, they're not hiding their light under a bushel. You know, they're <laughs> out there, there are thousands of families sending their children to these schools. And then, of course, beyond, so that, that, that's the Moscow network. But beyond the Moscow network, you've also got lots and lots of other Christian education providers out there, often providing resources for homeschool families, um, sunlight, um, you know, classical conversation. So there's, there's lots of different options out there, isn't there? But it's really interesting. If you go back and look at some of the older sunlight catalogs, um, you'll find them also advertising Rush Dooney's work. As, as part of a package for um, teenage students who might be interested in thinking about wow. how their Christian faith relates to broader um, social uh, questions. So there's a, there, there's a lot going on here. I, I think we, we can see a huge investment in education in the Moscow community, but I think we can also see how lots of these paradigms, lots of these aspirations, these goals, these objectives are being developed nationally and across a whole range of education providers, many of whom may not regard themselves as reformed at all. Mm. That's, uh, that's fascinating uh, to see how Moscow is carried on um, and, and in different ways, uh, Rush Dooney's legacy and the, the intellectual foundation he laid and thinking about all education as, as inherently religious and uh, his desire to see it uh, be totally divorced from the state, anti-statist, free market. Um, uh, Michael J. McVicker and, and other scholars like uh, Molly Wharton uh, or Warthen uh, have observed that uh, Rush Dooney, his influence is, is underappreciated or perhaps underrecognized uh, with regard to, to politics and, and government. Um, but you also draw out in your book how influential he was in, uh, as you put it, reorienting American education. I wonder if you could you could draw us into uh, his influence in that regard. That's, that, that's a great question, Ryan. So you mentioned Molly Worthen's book and Michael McVicker's book, both of them excellent uh, Apostles of Reason by Molly Worthen and, and then McVicker's biography of Rush Dooney, which, you know, which, which is a, a fascinating, if sometimes also very sad, um, um, biographical study. Two, th there's two other publications I think that help us with this. One is Julie Ingersoll's book uh, called Christian Reconstruction, came out with Oxford University Press maybe about three or four years ago. Julie Ingersoll writes with a with with as someone who's a religious studies scholar, but as someone who has a family background within Christian Reconstruction. And in fact, if I remember correctly, her husband, her her, her previous husband, her ex-husband was part of the family that set up Fairfax Christian School in Fairfax, Virginia, mm. which again is one of the early sort of flagship um, um, books. And if I remember correctly, her father-in-law wrote the volume on Christian education that was published in Gary North's series, Biblical Blueprints. Um, which the Children's Trap. Yeah, which you, you probably got three copies of that, Ryan. I, I uh, have a few, yeah. Yeah, good. Um, and, and of course, if you put them along in your thing, in your shelf, they all map out a, a complete global <laughs> that's map. Right. Don't they? That's right. So there's that. So, so the, the, there's that background. But then there's also a guy called Milton Geither. And M Milton Geither has written a book called Homeschool. Um, I forget the subtitle, but, but, but it's a history of American homeschooling. And in the second edition, which came out about two years ago from Palgrave Macmillan Publishers, um, he really expanded his discussion of Rush Dooney to show how um, to, to show how central Rush Dooney was to families in Texas, for example, uh, and many other states, obtaining the legal right to homeschool their children. So, you know, people have various views of Rush Dooney, some of them uh, less well-informed than others. Right. But one of the ways I think we need to think about Rush Dooney is as a legal reformer who um, really spent years of his life flying around the country to give expert witness in a number of sometimes very, very important key strategic um, um, uh, court cases in which families were under pressure um, to you know, give their children to state education systems. Uh, and and Rashtuni made the argument, which you've just rehearsed, Ryan, that um, 
that education is inherently religious. It's about foundational values. Um, it's not something that's just tacked on. It's not pragmatic. It's about principles. Uh, and therefore, uh, a family's right to educate their children in their own faith must be a key component of religious liberty in, in terms of the Constitution. So, you know, Rushdini gives himself to that. And I think that's probably his greatest success, you know, as you review um, his lifetime of achievement. The, the fact that today there may be three million American children pro provided with a homeschool education is largely thanks to R.J. Rushdini. Now, we can talk about R.J. Rushdini in very, you know, other contexts as well, some of them not nearly as happy as that. But, but I think that's a very important thing that we need to take away from his achievements. So re Reconstruction has always been about education. Um, Rushduni pushed for it, worked for it, but really I think it's um, the folk in Moscow, Idaho, who've really taken that vision and done most with it. Um, but absolutely, I think, building upon the foundations that Rushduni laid. Mm. That, you know, I, I would like to dig down into Rushduni more and, and back up maybe to the 60s, but then leading into the 70s. I think perhaps uh, at least one interesting entree uh, other than education to speak about Rush Dooney might be Christian Reconstruction's um, relationship to general or broader evangelicalism. And I'd, I'd love for you to comment on this or just to, to open up some of the, the themes that you address in the book regarding Christian Reconstruction's uh, relation to the general trends that we see among evangelicalism in the 70s and 80s, and particularly with the religious right and, you know, what was known at the time among many as the moral majority. Yeah. Yeah, well, of course, the moral majority was never the majority it was thought to be, was it? And <laughs> That's the evangelicals' problem, isn't it? They always round up too much, I think. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, round numbers. Uh, I mean, I, th I think Rush Dooney would, would never have been fooled by that. I, I think Rush Dooney was pretty clear that the number of people who were prepared to endorse what had to be done to live faithfully, uh, for the church to live faithfully, was always going to be a remnant. You know, and, and you know, the language of the remnant is language that floats through his writing um, in, in, I think, very considerable degrees. I think it's an interesting question, Camden, the question about how uh, influential um, Reconstruction ideas were on broader evangelicalism. In a way, we could say hardly influential at all because you know the story of 196 well 1970s into the 1980s the, the the christian coalition moral majority that that story is is the story of a, an attempted power grab yeah right. a, a top-down effort at national reformation we get our man into the white house pat robertson or wherever it's going to be you know and he'll do what we want so you know they get you know, 76, Jimmy Carter outs himself as an evangelical, raises lots of completely unfounded expectations as to what he's going to do, for example, about Roe v. Wade. Then they transfer their, you know, all of their utopian, almost millennial hopes into Ronald Reagan. What happens? The same thing all over again, different party, but the same kind of political experience. So, you know, all of these efforts to achieve Christian reformation through top-down implementation of power um, fails again, again, and again. Meanwhile, you've got Rush Dooney, Chalcedon uh, Foundation, toiling away quietly uh, in, in, in California, you know, producing rafts of publications, Gary North doing the same, um, you know, little communities springing up, um, collapsing, springing up, collapsing, all over different parts of, of especially the southern states. But, but some of their ideas then begin to, to creep out and to permeate into some really unusual places. Now, Julie Ingersoll, um, in her book, Christian Reconstruction, writes about this, I think, really well. And, and, and she describes how, you know, in some of the lobbying organisations in Washington, you know, th there are shelves of Reconstructionist books um, sitting there um, um, ready to be used. Um, I remember back in the late 1990s when I was you know, collecting a lot of this material, I found in another secondhand bookshop in Scotland uh, a copy of one of Gary North's books about economics, which had inside it a, a book plate that said it had it had belonged, or perhaps even maybe it still did belong, uh, to the Royal <laughs> Bank of Scotland. I have wow. no idea how books get from, you know, a, a bank collection yeah. into a secondhand bookshop. But anyway, you know, there it was, and I've still got it. So, you know, Gary North's books, 
um, you know, in the Royal Bank of Scotland, um, other books in, in lobbying organisations. But really, you know, reconstructionist ideas do begin to make an impact on evangelicalism through Francis Schaeffer. And Francis Schaeffer um, has a relationship with R.J. Rostuni's work that is difficult to be precise about. <laughs> but there is certainly, I mean, there are certainly chunks of Rostuni yeah. that appear in that appear in, in Schaefer's work thematically very, very similar. Let's put it that way. Uh, and perhaps other kinds of similarities as well. Now, in, in some ways that's ironic because Schaefer wasn't post-millennial, he was pre-millennial and um, than Rashtuni ever was. Rashtuni in his Christian manifesto, uh, the need for, for Christian citizens to resist the state from time to time. Rashtuni doesn't go down that route at all. He's much more interested in retreating um, in order to survive instead of trying to conquer America by military force. And, you know, I suppose one thing you could say that, that Rashtuni... Um, was trying to teach American evangelicals that they might not have been listening to was that the transformation of the individual through regeneration has to come before the transformation of families, of localities, of counties, of states, and then ultimately federal government itself. But the, the Reconstructionist vision is very much bottom in the 80s. I think probably also to the present. Russ Dooney, uh, so I'm wondering if you might be able to, to speak with us a bit about his own personal biography in terms of his, his family history from where he came and also maybe some of his early works because in, in, in many regards, we have a book here uh, behind uh, Ryan uh, down in the corner here, By What Standard? And, and he was in many ways an early uh, interpreter of Cornelius Van Til, and he had a pretty close relationship uh, with Van Til early on. And then once he got into more political uh, territory, Van Til somewhat distanced uh, from uh, from Rush, as as he's called in the letters. Uh, yeah. But it, it's interesting to see, and and important, I think, to recognize uh, RJR's re, uh, influence early on, especially because it's it's a uh, it might not be understood so many by, especially by Van Tilians, how how important Rush was in the those in those late sixties years and early seventies. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I think that's a fascinating question, Camden. Um, I mean, if, if listeners want to follow this up, Michael J. McVicker's book is is really good on this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but to 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 you know to, to think about your question, um, Rushduni comes from an Armenian family. Not an Armenian family, an right. Armenian family, um, but his, you know, his 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 um, his parents had been survivors of the Armenian genocide, and you know they had, they had moved. His father, I think, actually studied at New College Edinburgh and was ordained in the Church of Scotland, and that's the kind of Presbyterian background that R.G. Rushduni came from. His father then moved to America, um, I think, was a PCUSA minister, and that was Rushduni's own background. Um, but but Rushduni, R.J. Rushduni, um, was determined that the fate that had happened to Armenian Christians should never occur t- within America. That American Christians had to be equipped intellectually, theologically, uh, and also pastorally to anticipate a great crisis that was going to come their way. And I think, you know... Our, our just, our, you know, R.J. Rastuni gets a lot of negative press, and I'm not saying that's not deserved. That that there are parts of his work that you know that that are certainly um, not the, what we would want to be identified with at all. Um, but but he is, I think, a prophetic figure in that he can see more clearly than almost anyone else that I've read in the '60s what the path of American society and culture is going to be through the succeeding decades. And of course, the reason why he can become such an acute prophet, I mean, to use that kind of language, such an acute observer of the trends within American society and the direction of American society is because he's applying Cornelius Van Til's basic um, concepts to his reading of American culture. So so, so Rashtuni is very, very clear. As the decades roll towards the 20th century, um, Americans, given their various backgrounds, are going to become more true to themselves. They're, they're, they're going, you know, they're going to resolve lots of the inner contradictions 
by being more simply who they actually are. Now, Van Til, as you know, has got a whole language for describing that sure. that I'm not equipped uh, to, you know, to, to, to even engage with. Right. But but Rushdini uses Van Til as a tool um, to, to make those kinds of, of prognostications. And of course, you know, they are right. Um, yes, as Rushdini became more orientated towards social reconstruction, um, uh, that, that whole agenda, Van Til does seem to get uh, get very uncomfortable with some of the direction that he's going in. But Rashduni, I think, might have been one of the first to publish a study of Van Til's thought um, back yes. in, was it the late 1950s? I can't quite remember. Yeah, 1958. Exactly. Oh, was that 58. early? 58. Yeah. yeah, by what standard came up. Oh, I That's thought right. that was so, in the 60s. So it's really early. Mm-hmm. Well, there's so much. I mean, we're, we're, we're discussing history today, and there are no doubt going to be many listeners who, you know, may, may be even yelling at their car speakers at the moment or they're off for a run and they're they're wishing that we would address you know some some deeper issues regarding the critique of theonomy and christian reconstruction that's not our task today i just want to say that out loud we can do that at a later program we're, we're discussing the history and um and this is more from an historical and a sociological and even to a degree political perspective um just to make a comment though re- regarding van till's connection to theonomy it's my personal uh, uh, position, and as well as shared by a lot of other Vantillian scholars, that Christian Reconstructionism often misses the profound influence of Gerhardus Voss upon Cornelius Vantill, which leads them into some other, you know, um, developments, theological and political and social, that that uh, made Vantill a bit uncomfortable, which is borne out in his letters. But that's for another day, perhaps a different discussion where we can pick that uh, strand up. Ryan, you can comment on that if you want, whether you agree well, or disagree. I mean, I uh, I suppose I'll, I'll I'll leave it at this. Um, I I agree with Bonson that I I won't I won't give up that Van Til had the spirit of Reconstruction, even if he didn't go go all the way there with his his flying high the banner of uh, of pro reggae with Kuiper. And we were just talking about the other yeah. day um, Charles G. Dennison and the history of the OPC and the influence of Van Til. And I think the the direction that we've gone here at Reform Forum has been more with the the pilgrim ethic, of course, and, and mentality. Yeah. Um, but he does recognize that that Van Til did have that um, that great desire to to seize seize culture for for Jesus Christ and to assert his his total lordship uh, over all things in heaven and on earth. So it's it's a bigger discussion and a it good is. one to and, have. And even that, well, made, you know, Van Til's relation to Kuiper is is demanding a dissertation of its own, I think. And uh, that a lot of his writings on that neo Kuiperianism, neo Calvinism makes people uncomfortable, uh, the, especially you know people much more in the in the Pilgrim camp, for lack of a better word, which I find myself in. Um, nevertheless, uh, there, there's a lot to to be explored. Uh, Crawford, on uh, uh, speaking, you, I love the way you divide the chapters up in this book, and uh, it's it's just very well constructed, and of course, uh, it, it's very well written. So I appreciate what you've done, and uh, you know, for we're not going to have time perhaps to get into all the details that I would like to at the moment. We might be able to have a round two at some point, but there's an entire chapter on migration, and I think that's really. Uh, an important place to begin. It's one of the early chapters in the book. You already mentioned John Wesley Rawls, and and we've talked a bit about the survival streak in the Pacific Northwest. Um, I, I I suppose I'm 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 interested if you might expand upon that. If there are any other reasons for that particular geographic location of the United States to attract certain people, and perhaps even why has the community in Moscow, Idaho, begun in Moscow, Idaho? Is it incidental? Do you find any uh, innate features of the landscape or the the culture in that area that might make it more fertile ground uh, for such movements? Because I, w- I wouldn't mind, I'm kind of half joking, but I'm not really. I, I'm open to uh, moving to Southeastern or perhaps even, you know, uh, uh, Midwest or uh, Mid-Northern Michigan. If anyone wants to invite me to maybe move there, has a homestead for me or something like that, I'd be there as long as I could get to a good library in 45 minutes. So I'll just leave that open. But if you're going to tell me that it wouldn't work in Michigan, then I'll just give up my dream. <laughs> well, yeah, that's interesting. There's a, there's, there's a very well-known Presbyterian author called Louis Thoreau, <laughs> no, Louis Thoreau is a satirical documentary maker. Yeah, and uh, 
he he did he did this um, he did this documentary where he went to North Idaho and visited uh, some of the sort of semi survivalist communities in that area, and he sat down with a man called Bo Gritz or Bo Gritz, as sometimes he's, he's known, who's a kind of a <laughs> Vietnam vet, did a lot of work trying to find MIA POWs after Vietnam, um, was a Constitution Party presidential candidate and so on. But anyway, Louis Thoreau meets Bo Gritz, and Bo Gritz lays out this map of the Pacific Northwest, and he gets a great big permanent marker, and he shows that the lines of nuclear drift that <laughs> might go across the North American continent. Right. You know, he... He, he points out that the closer you are to the coast, the more you might experience a big, big flood. Uh, and, and anyway, you know, by a process of elimination, scribbling all around the map, he leaves this tiny frame empty. And that's, you know, that's what's now the American Redoubt. So the American Redoubt has been calling people for a long, long time. You know, it's part of the whole Western myth, isn't it? Um, of, you know, utopian communities often it's set up uh, on, on, on the boundaries of, of, of the American experience in different kinds of ways. Um, but what is it that, that really generated this community's foundation in Moscow, Idaho? Well, I think actually the answer is a lot more pragmatic than any of these things. Uh, and that is back in the 1970s, Jim Wilson, who's Doug Wilson's father, um, was, was, I think, if I remember correctly, was running a series of evangelistic bookshops and he was looking for the best towns, the best locations to put these bookshops in. And, um, you know, I think famously within the Moscow, Idaho world, uh, he identified, he, he had two criteria for identifying where he would um, want to have an evangelistic bookshop based. And he said that the two criteria were the town should be strategic and achievable. So, um, you know, any major city is strategic. But, you know, Chicago is not achievable. Um, any small town is, is achievable, but not every small town is strategic. Yeah. So he, he looked at the Moscow Pullman area on either side of the Washington Idaho border. He realized there's two, you know, it's a small community, 20,000 people, but it's got two major universities. You know, and, and he quickly came to the conclusion that that was a that, that was an area where um, you know a, a relatively small number of Christian families could make a strategically significant impact um, for the kingdom, um, and you know that's what happened. The family moved there. They began to you know form uh, the nucleus of a church. Doug Wilson took over, and gradually it began to expand. But I think I mean I think fundamentally that's that's what allowed the group to begin in that area. What allowed the group to continue in that area? Was actually the invention of desktop publishing software. Yeah. So you know, one of the things that Doug Wilson explained, you know, when we're chatting to him about this, was um, that that he realised that that technological advances meant that anyone in any small town in North America had at their fingertips the ability to create texts and even eventually to circulate texts. But they didn't need to be based in New York or Manhattan or, or wherever it may be. And of course, then you know, once they established Canon Press. Um, which was the, the publishing arm of the Christchurch community. That, I think, was what allowed them to begin really to push forward the circulation of some of their ideas. Now, mm -hmm. I mentioned earlier on, at the very start of the, the conversation, Credenda Agenda in the 1990s. Um, um, like lots of other people who like free things, I subscribe to that <laughs> um, uh, because it was completely free. Yeah. And they were sending out copies all over the world. They were sending one to me, you know, in Scotland, in, in Northern Ireland. I was getting these copies of this. And in fact, in the late 1990s, Credenda Agenda had 22,000 subscribers. Now, that's a lot of magazine, magazines to get published and circulated. Yeah, that costs a lot. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it, it was, I suppose, the strategic decision to remain in Moscow, to, to build a community in a small town where they really did begin to make a bit of an impact in the local area. It was that decision, I think, um, that, that uh, which was made possible by desktop publishing software and other technological yeah. um, achievements uh, that, that allowed the group to grow as it did. No, oh, it's it, that. That's exactly. You already hit on something that I was uh, thoroughly interested to follow up in after reading the book, and um, it, and it is the self consciousness or, or the strategic, you know, thinking involved. And I wondered how how self conscious they were in terms of their marketing and and specifically their publishing efforts, because what we find in this in this broad community of, of Christian reconstruction, it, there's so many prolific authors, like seriously prolific authors, uh, anywhere from Rush Dooney uh, and just his reading and writing habits just 
make my head hurt. I wish I could think and write as much as he does. Or Gary North, for, uh, for example. But they they read and write so much. I was I was curious. You know, nowadays you look back and you wonder, well, you know, this is a content marketing strategy. Or are they are they self aware of doing these like influencer marketing, uh, or are they just pursuing their passion? Or perhaps is it just a combination of the two? Whether they're intelligent and wise about what they're doing, but at the same time they're they're so prolific just because they're they're thinking and writing about what they're passionate about. Yeah, interesting question, Camden. Really interesting. I mean, I think I think you're right. They are they are as a group smart people yeah. uh, or certainly they are led by smart people mm-hmm. intelligent people people who know how to communicate who know how to communicate well people who know when controversy is actually a useful tool people who are not scared of controversy uh, 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 and so on now i mean i think when you look back to the 1990s and credenda agenda it ha- i mean it has the feel of um, a, a Calvinist version of Private Eye, which is a satirical magazine in the UK. There'll be—I don't know what the equivalent is in the US, but you know, it, it's got that kind of tongue-in-cheek witticism. Yeah. Uh, it's you know, it's cheeky. Uh, it's a little bit avant-garde, but it's also thoughtful and reflective. You know, and it's you know, it's really arguing for a preterist interpretation of Revelation in, in in a regular column. You know, so it's doing lots of different things. And, you know, if you start reading some of the letters pages, they're kind of hilarious. There's Anabaptists <laughs> writing in. Uh, there, there's people who are Eastern Orthodox writing in. One of my favourite letters, I think, comes from uh, a, a Saturday Sabbath Baptist. Um, you know, and you know, there's, there's, it's, it's like a, a collection of the weird and wonderful, uh, which, you know, <laughs> maybe makes me realise why I felt I was <laughs> reading something that was kind of yeah. stimulating and bizarre sometimes, but also, you know, interesting sure fun ways. Uh, but so you know all, all of this is happening but fast forward fast forward to 2020 25 years later and you've got i mean if, if you visit doug wilson's website it's very very knowing i think it's it's, it's self-conscious uh, and i think that there's a there's a branding exercise going on there i think doug wilson recognizes that in some ways the brand has been built around him uh, and you know, there's bear in mind now that you know that that community is is full of incredibly creative people, artists, filmmakers, musicians, and you know, when it comes to making a good quality product, they really know how to do it. They really know how to do it. And you know, if, if you look at the Amazon Prime talk show that Doug Wilson hosts at the moment, um, called uh, Man Rampant, mm-hmm. I've only watched a couple of episodes, but you know, it, it, again, it's built around him and a small number of other leaders of that community um but 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 it's but it's also very professional in its production uh you know in in in, um in the way it's presented and so on but it's not it doesn't take a softly softly approach and you know some of the i think that the the kind of humor that marked some of the earlier literary productions in this community that seems to have gone it's much more earnest it's much much more i think um in your face you know it's much more direct uh, and i think that probably in some respects reflects both the maturing of yeah. this community as well as the increasing sen- as well as their sense of um the, the increasing or the increasingly dangerous situation in which they find themselves mm-hmm. uh, so it's become a lot more urgent a lot more direct um you know but at the same time you know a- a- along the way they have as you say, they have moved from writing with Canon Press to writing with major, major imprints. Right. Uh, and, you know, they, they've, they've collected um, co-authors of the likes of Christopher Hitchens. You know, this is not an obscure group. that It might be small in number, but it, it really has put a huge amount of effort into extensive cultural reach, which is pulling people. You know, it's generating an international audience much, much more effectively than sending out 22,000 copies of a physical magazine to people like me who are, you know, who would refuse to pay for it, but are happy yeah. to get something for free. Sure. Uh, you know, so so this is something which is is commodified, um, if I can use a Marxist term on uh, Crisis Centre. Sure. Uh, so so we'll there's a real it. commodification of this theology. You know, there's a, um, the, 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 I think there are marketing strategies. It's very savvy. It's very knowing. It's very intelligent. And as I say, the content is produced by smart people you might not like what they what they write lots of people don't lots of christians don't uh, a huge number of local people who are not christians don't mm. um 
But nevertheless, you know, they, they know what they're doing and they seem to be doing it very effectively. And in the community, I, I, I understand the risk maybe even of saying that the community, because from the outside, we, we might think that, you know, there's a this tightly defined group and you have a membership card or not. It's, it doesn't work that way. Nevertheless, people uh, within this community have transcended even not just uh, Canon Press and uh, their own self-publishing. It's not really self-publishing, but their internal publishing efforts not just to get outside of that, but also have transcended the genre, so to speak. Uh, they're doing videos as well, but th- this isn't merely didactic prose, as you say in the book, but have really expanded into all sorts of other forms of, of cultural production and art. Exactly. Poetry, uh, fiction, um, N.D. Wilson, Nate, Nate Wilson is uh, yeah. Doug Wilson's son. Right. Um, you know, he's, he's been extremely successful as a children's author. And in fact, um, his Hello Ninja character has got a, a, a number of series now on, on Netflix as well. So, yeah, you're right. I mean, I think what's really interesting is some of their material is very, very direct. The theological material takes no prisoners. But the imaginative material, the more creative material, is very subtle. Um, you know, and it's doing a different kind of thing. It performs a different function within the ecology of disseminating ideas or, or just, I mean, in some respects, you could you, you could see the, the, the very didactic theological material as directly related to recruiting uh, new members or, or at least disseminating key ideas, whereas the creative material is working at a much more subtle level. Mm-hmm. And it seems to be building um, implicitly, very quietly, very subtly, building a Christian worldview without ever saying that's what it's doing. Mm. Now, you know, when you read N.D. Wilson's work, you've really got to pay attention to see what allusions he's making, whether it's to scripture or to, you know, Mark Twain or to, to you know, classical authors or, or whatever. Uh, but, but if you can get tuned into that and, and pay attention to that, you can see that he is working to talk about, you know, the intermediate state or indeed to, 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 to think about the crisis of fatherlessness, or, or some of these other you know, really big, wide-ranging cultural uh, themes. So, yeah, there's, there's a huge amount going on, huge amount going on. And I think now with the, the establishment of a music conservatory, I think that will obviously take didacticism in a completely different direction because there, what's being produced is excellence in culture. Not, it's not art for art's sake, but it is excellence in culture, mm-hmm. but in, in a non-verbal uh, mode in the mode of music. Yeah, mm. I, I'd love to hear you speak, uh, Dr. Gribben, about how um, this this culture building, this this culture warfare, uh, relates to the the post millennialism of of Reconstructionists, whether in the Moscow community or or Rush Dooney, um, and perhaps you might uh, draw from your own interests in in Puritanism and also uh, in Darby and dispensationalism. Uh, would you tell us a bit about how um, the, the post-millennialism of, of Reconstruction, uh, how it situates within the, the larger uh, framework, historical framework of, of American Puritanism and, and post-millennials like John Winthrop or uh, Jonathan Edwards, and then how it comes to really uh, uh, an antithesis, a, a huge contrast with dispensationalism. Yeah, that's a really interesting question, Ryan. Um, I, I mean, w- w- one of the one of the questions I had when I was, you know, speaking to these people and writing about these people was how important was postmillennialism actually, and was like is postmillennialism a necessary part of the system? Does it depend on postmillennialism to work? And you know, I mean, I asked Doug Wilson that, that question in more or less as many words. And he's, his answer was simply that it's easier to win if you believe you're on the winning side, which I suppose is true. Um, of course, all Christians, no matter what their eschatological position, believe they are ultimately on the winning side. Um, you know, sure. it's, it's, it's not that a millennialist. Um, if there are any millennialists out there, I don't know if any exist anymore. Um, but <laughs> That's what they said I, about post-millennials, uh, you know, 50 years ago, right? Oh, goodness. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, you know, c- c- could you be a premillennialist and also a reconstructionist? Mm. Well, in a way, I think the answer to that is yes, because James Wesley Rawls, who's the other big writer that I talk about in the book, um, is self-identified as a Reformed Baptist, but who also seems to be a, a, an historic premillennialist, not a dispensational, pre-tribulational premillennialist, 
but a historic post-tribulational premillennialist. So, you know, he, he has that, James Wesley Rawls has that view of the future, that yes, there's about to be an impending crisis, that Christians must be prepared to resist uh, and hopefully survive. But that crisis may not be the tribulation, but, the, but an actual tribulation is coming uh, in which there will be, you know, massive destruction of, of, um, of, of Christians and Christian influence in society, um, which will then be followed by the millennium. So, uh, you know, he, he doesn't present himself necessarily as a reconstructionist, but he does uh, um, rec- uh, he, he include Scary North in the acknowledgements of several of his books. Uh, he, he, he describes himself really as a, a libertarian, but he also says that um, the best government will be based on the Ten Commandments. So there's a kind of a, a tension there, an ambiguity there. But I think it's fair to call him a reconstructionist, who's also a premillennialist. Um, where does pre- so where does post-millennialism fit into the long history of millennialism in America? Well, I think, I mean, you mentioned John Winthrop. It's always been there. You mentioned Jonathan Edwards. Uh, Edwards really believes the millennium is beginning in, in the Great Awakening of the 1730s and 1740s. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's curious to think what Edwards would say if he was dropped into Moscow, Idaho. What would he make of this? You know, and I think if you also told him, by the way, Kanye West just became a believer, uh, you know, um, you know, I, I, I think he'd be pretty excited, actually. <laughs> That's one way to put it. Oh, it, you know, we should speak with our, our buddy Jeff Waddington somewhat about that. We long, long time ago done some episodes uh, commenting on Edwards proclivity for reading the paper, you know, even through his, his uh, pre or post-millennialism interpretive grid. Um, Dr. Gribben, we were really, I, we can go all day. We won't keep you all day. Perhaps again, we can, we could speak in the future, but I, I do want to at least uh, finish on, on a point connecting this back to some recent literature that was very popular, um, at least here in the States a, a couple of years ago. And I'm just taking a quote here, an excerpt from your from the end here, your conclusion. You write, uh, McIntyre, as in Alistair McIntyre, concluded after virtue with hope for a new St. Benedict. But other theorists, also developing their programs of renewal in the 1970s, were doing more to challenge dominant narratives and to inspire the creation of sustainable communities of survival, resistance, and reconstruction. Perhaps in the person of Rush Dooney, the evangelical St. Benedict had already arrived. Could you comment and elaborate on that comment? I thought that was a remarkable paragraph. Well, yeah, what does it mean? That's a really good question. Um, well, Alistair McIntyre, back and after Virtue, had argued that, that American culture was increasingly divided between competing moral communities. So there was no, and I mean, I think that, you know, the recent, the last couple of decades has really borne this out, that, 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 that Americans are divided into moral subsections, if you like, moral communities, and they find it very hard to speak um, over the you know over the border into the next moral community, assuming that there's any kind of shared uh, definition for what is good or what is bad, uh, and, and McIntyre at the end of his book um, after ethics is arguing that one one Christian path uh, through the crisis that he anticipated you know crisis is a big theme but the crisis that he anticipated in American culture would be for Christians to begin to strategically withdraw. Um, to, to, to nurture um, their, their own communities, to, you know, to, to nurture their own families within the faith and to live separately, to live in an almost Benedictine way within right. a wider society. So, you know, I was, I was reading that. I was reading, obviously, Rod Dreher's Benedict Option book uh, and, you know, trying to keep up to date with some of the things that he was saying, which seemed to sort of riff off McIntyre mm-hmm. uh, in, in different kinds of ways. And I suppose it just struck me that, you know, this was what Rush Dooney had been trying to do, um, and of course, this, the, the, you know, this this idea of strategic migration, building concentrations of strength and influence, uh, with a view to enduring uh, an imminent crisis and working to achieve something greater in the far side of that crisis. That you know, that's not only at the heart of the Rush Dooney enterprise, that's also at the heart of the Moscow Idaho enterprise as well. Um, so, you know, as I, I said, I think I said before earlier on in our conversation that I think we can see Rush Dooney as a kind of a profit figure. Uh, I, I think he is. I think he is farsighted. I think he can see the direction of Western culture. Uh, he is using Vantillian tools, 
not just to analyze what the what, what the problem is but also to think about what solutions might be i think he, he tries to craft solutions i don't think his solutions are desperately successful but it's the it's not the reconstructionist 2.0 that take that forward it's the reconstructionist 0.5 who take that forward who bolt rush Dooney's ideas into this much more ambitious cultural as well as social and political agenda and you know it's now the second generation perhaps even third generation heirs of Rushduni who are communicating these very ideas on platforms like Netflix Amazon Prime through publishers like Oxford University Press uh, Penguin Random House Simon Schuster all the big publication all, all the big publisher names and um, so you know Rushduni came he didn't see he didn't conquer um, but but he perceived what you know what what, what the direction of uh, the, the 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 culture was going to be I think and I think bequeathed the tools of analysis and also the ambition not only to survive and reconstruct but to rebuild in the far side to um, individuals like Doug Wilson and others in the Moscow Idaho community who I think have been able to do far more with those insights and ideas than Rushduni or that first generation of reconstructionists were able to achieve. Yeah, I found this history thoroughly compelling. Uh, I didn't want to stop reading and, and, and studying it. I'm tremendously thankful for this book, for its existence. We've only really we've covered a lot of ground, but people need to read the book. So I, I encourage people to pick up a copy of this. I think it was, what, 20, only 29 bucks from uh, or thereabouts from, from OUP. So it's definitely affordable. Um, from f at least on Oxford scale, <laughs> not 175 or, or the prices for the handbooks. Yeah. No, which, but they're they're all excellent. Well, they're top notch. Yeah. This is one of the world's great publishers. But uh, of course, survival and resistance in evangelical America: Christian Reconstruction in the Pacific Northwest, published by Oxford University Press, and written by our our guest today, Dr. Crawford Gribben. Crawford, thanks so much for taking the time to speak with us across the pond. It's been a it's been a pleasure, and we need to. One way or the other, next time you're in the States, you come over to the Midwest or we need to we need to find some some grant writing foundation to, to fund Ryan and I to come visit you. There we go. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's Thank really you, good. Dr. Griffin. Uh, it's, it's been a been, pleasure. It's been our pleasure. I do want to uh, point people to the various uh, websites and all, and we'll have uh, links in the episode description to the various resources we've discussed, as well as if you want to read up on Dr. Griffin and uh, his, his CV. Uh, and we're online at reformedforum.org. There you'll find information about all of our programs, uh, online courses, uh, publications, all that sort of thing. We're not a can of press, but, uh, but we're slowly get <laughs> getting there. Uh, from our distinct uh, pilgrim mentality, our Vossian and Vantillian bent, which which we are unashamed and hopefully would write as, uh, as if we're taking no prisoners as well. But I do want to thank everybody for listening, and we hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center. <laughs>